So um, I'm going to talk, I'm a GP, I'm Nairi Kuris. I'm also head of the School of Population Health. And I want to thank you all for taking students who take stu medical students in their practices. Some, there should be a lot more, you can contact me after. And, <laughs> and also for all the research studies that you've participated in over the years uh, associated with all the universities. Very important, so let's talk about falls. Fantastic introduction from Shankar. So just a couple of extra points from the very clinical general practice perspective. Your Parkinson's disease patients, your Lewy body d disease patients, your patients with lots of medications, they are there. The injury of hip fracture is just the tip of the iceberg. It's actually the falls that don't cause injury, that tend to happen recurrently, that uh, really impair the confidence and the ability of the older person to be independent. So you want to think of all levels of independence, and they are in your office all the time. Okay, stand hands up who's fallen in the last year. I always fall over. Yeah, okay, Any, did anybody end up in hospital or having to see their doctor? I actually did. Yes, two or three. So we're young, right? <laughs> so the reason, the reason that uh, older people, uh, falls are so important is because they're fragile. If you think about your children, how many times they just fell over and got the stroke back up again, how many times they fell off the, corp, the porch and the couch and all that, it's okay for them. But here you see the very old hospitalizations rising in a parabolic way from age 65, 75. This disparity here is a little bit of something else, but we're not to talk about that today. <laughs> Falls and injury are directly correlated, so if you're preventing falls, you're preventing injury. I've committed academic sin and got too many slides, so I'm going to go fast. Now, the most important challenge, in my view, for general practitioners faced with somebody with a fall is to work out whether it's an acute emergency or not, because older people are fantastic at masking really significant in, um, diagnoses. So they mask, you know, um, significant infections. If you ever get a person who's got a temperature over 85 degrees, then admit them to hospital if they're over 75 or 85 themselves, because if they actually get to mount a fever, they're really ill. A cardiovascular event uh, can just present as being a little bit woofy or having a fall. So if you have someone in front of you who's old, who's comorbid, and they've had a fall, don't just immediately think, oh, I'm going to refer them to ACC. Think, okay, is it, which is it? Is it a hot or a cold fall? John Campbell, um, who's a fantastic professor who's passed on now, coined this idea that you could have hot falls and cold falls, and I quite like that, because that means that you've got to think. So, okay, here's the person, is it hot? Are they hot? Are they significantly unwell? Is there something that's new that has just arisen for this person? You can relax a little bit after you've checked them out. Whereas cold falls are the ones that are less acute that we've all, well, I've done several falls prevention trials myself. I've even been, been uh, accused of causing falls in residential care. But um, the less acute ones, when they're multifactorial, you can relax a little bit. Okay, so let's, so when you get this person in front of you, What's your approach? Okay, have they injured themselves? I give this lecture to medical students and you get all into the prevention and all into the risk factors and then the person's still got a skin knee or they've still got an injured elbow. So don't forget that when they've fallen, they will have an injury potentially. Sometimes that injury doesn't show up for a while. Hands up, who looks after people in residential care? Okay, so who's missed a hip fracture in their life? Yeah, they're easy to miss, particularly so, you know, externally rotated and shortened. You've got to examine the person. Is this an old or a new problem? Are they acutely unwell, some intrinsic risk factors up there, and then are they poisoned? One medical school lecturer told me that if something happened to an older person, I'd poison them until, until proven otherwise. And we do. We use lots of medications. And then the older person goes to the chemist and picks up an antihistamine or a decongestant, which increases the anticholinergic burden, and suddenly there's a side effect there that in the in their complex mixture. So assume they are poisoned until proven otherwise. So you have to be a detective. These are the pills that one of our colleagues prescribed to an older person. In Australia, I know you would never do it here. But the very important thing here is that they were all full. All of those bottles were full. So this is, this is intelligent non-compliance, I think. 
you can see there there's Valium and there's Indesid and there's something called the tablet. So know what your older people are getting and know whether they are taking them. And this is something that should be an ongoing discussion. You're allowed to stop medications, don't stop them all at once. I'm not a de-prescribing um, evangelist. I think sensible use of medications is the answer. And unfortunately, the cardiovascular prevention medications work. And if you get guidelines which give you an extra three on top of their five, then they may need eight but you must keep a surveillance on those medications and understand the interactions. And when they fall, that's a really good reason to really start stopping them. Okay, so plain old simple, take a history and do a physical examination. If there's one thing you could do that would uncover some things, it would be a lying and a standing blood pressure. We all forget about postural hypotension. It is a real clinical sign which is detectable, which if you, it is there, you can do something about. Gait and balance assessment. Most of you do this when you're watching the older person walk down the hall. What is the pace like? Is it even? Is it, are they easy to turn around? When you talk to them as they're walking down the hall, do they have to stop and look at you? That's a significant risk factor for falls, the talking and walking sign. If they can carry on and text and talk and all that at the same time, then that's a much lower risk. So you can do that on yourself, the texting and walking test. <laughs> Don't do it on stairs. Okay, the timed up and go is a very simple thing, but you need three meters, and that's an issue for many practices. But I use the eye chart. So I get them to put the chair under the eye chart, and then they, with a stopwatch, with a three meter mark, Stand, walk three metres, turn around, walk back and sit down again, stop, watch. If that is more than 10 seconds, they're at a risk of falls. If it's more than 15, they're at significant risk. And it's a very simple, you can just see it's not rocket science. If they can't get up from a chair easily and walk, then they're at a higher risk of falls. And then the clinical evaluation, consider all their medications, including asking them what they got from the chemist and what they've been taking of their husbands and whether their daughter gave them their sleeping pills. So <clears throat> don't prescribe for your elderly relatives um, without telling their GPs. Then I think if you think it's a hot fall, you have to think about the things that might be the cause. So you might well do an ECG. You should be thinking about some bloods. So my elderly relative presented to the GP with a fall and he had a haemoglobin of 77 and he had gastric cancer. So those people will be there in your waiting rooms and in your surgeries as well. So think about whether they've got something significant and ongoing underlying. And sometimes those people who present with a fall need secondary care. Management, treat the injury, treat the causes that you identify expect loss of confidence and fear of falling, think about restoration. And the first thing about that is reassurance. Now it's okay, I understand that you'll be shook up by this. It's gonna be okay. I want you to just concentrate on walking inside the house. I want you then to concentrate on walking outside the house. And I'm going to refer you to the Falls Prevention Community Program, which is all um, certified by ACC as being lower limb strengthening and falls retraining. And that can be done in an in-home service or in a community um, setting. Don't forget about the home occupational therapy assessment and, managed, and what's it called? A, a home hazard assessment and modifications. Assessment alone doesn't work. The modifications are necessary. So yes, the rails and the redo of the bathroom and the lights on the stairs, all of that is important, but the modifications have to happen. I tried to get this organised once uh, last year and it took six to seven months. Oh, better keep going. Okay, cold falls. Thinking a fall event which results in the person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or other lower level. It used to be not due to medical issues. Just think for a moment about the interaction of these things. The person, the risk factors, the place, the environment, and the exposure, risky behaviours, we know a lot about the person risk factors, we know something about the environment, we don't know anything about what people do when they fall over. My father, when he was 82, I came home to see him one day and I said, oh, Dad, what have you been doing? And he said, I've been painting the roof. And I said, and he said, Nairi, it's okay, I knew you would be worried, so I tied myself to the chimney. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I imagine immediately man imagined him dangling off the edge. But when he was 84, he chopped down about a 60 meter tree from his front garden. I had the same hand palpitations when he did that, but he was fine because he tied himself to the tree. <laughs> <coughs> So the clinical evaluation for cold falls. Again, take a history and think about the risk factors. Um, the uh, history risk factors, age, sex, older age, female sex, prior fall is the strongest risk factor, strokes, arthritis, depression, very important. Depression and falls go hand in hand. Parkinson's disease, dementia, dementia and falls also go hand in hand. And then in your examination, gait abnormalities, vision, foot problems, cardiovascular problems. Now just a two minutes, I'm gonna go over time I know, but I'll try really hard to stop. Okay, so cognition and gait, there's something going on with there. So yes, people with dementia fall over more, but there's a systematic or systemic uh, association with the way you walk. Increased stride to stride variability, increased um, sway, and there's something central going on with cognition and gait. In fact, now they're thinking that gait might be a very accurate biomarker of, of dementia coming on before the behavioural and cognition signs come. Depression and gait issues also go hand in hand. So we all think depression is just a mood disorder, but there is something centrally happening in the brain with dementia too. Again, stride to stride variability and reaction times are, di are, are different. So when you see people with cognition and depression, think of falls and think about their gait and send them along to those classes to get their balance and, um, and lower limbs re-strengthened. The common risk factors, awareness, attention, low attention and reaction times go with all of those three things, cognition, depression and falls. So while there's not enough evidence yet to suggest that we do cognitive training, I think that will come. Certainly putting a cognitive challenge in the physical activity that people do is a very good thing to do. So that means doing quirky kinds of exercise. And so you have to be creative to think of that. The simplest thing is to do sums on the treadmill, but I think that's really boring. Okay, do an examination. Again, lying and standing blood pressure, gait and balance, timed up and go. Consider all the medications very similar to the assessment for hot falls. And then you think about all the preventive processes and get them activated. Physical and cognitive challenge and remember the environment. So we should be hitting our DHBs with lots of referrals for OT assessments so that they have to respond by giving us more OTs. Just very briefly, interventions from the Cochrane Review. Um, I know it's, um, Shankar's already covered it a little bit. Exercise, group exercise and home-based exercise, very well proven to reduce falls. That is why ACC is focusing on this aspect of prevention. Also reduces um, fall-related fracture. Home assessment and modification is also important. And then medication education and feedback is promising but not yet proven. And I would say we haven't done enough research just simply working with the medicines they're on. Not vitamin D in the ordinary person and careful with visual interventions. If you take out one cataract, that will prevent falls. But if you change the glasses, falls will be worse for a little while because everyone has to adapt. Exercise for falls also works for people with cognitive impairment. This was a separate review uh, released re recently and it's got to be lower leg strengthening, balance retraining, and people have to have good adherence. And adherence is the issue for people with dementia. Okay, just one minute about residential care. Here is the prevalence of main risk factors. Absolutely huge in residential care. 60% of the population fall every year, and of course they are much more fragile than your community counterparts. Residential care is a hazardous environment. We tie them down and we put obstacles in their way. We put them in lovely bedrooms like this with cords and they furniture walk on furniture which falls over and you know, it's a real, this is the variation in wards of falls. It's huge. We don't know why this variation happens in residential care. Okay, so care facilities. Vitamin D works here. This is a at risk population who never go out. Vitamin D reduces fallers. Uh, reduces falls but not fallers. I'm about to write a letter to Ian Reid and um, Professor Boland because it's very worthwhile in residential care. Exercise alone, we're having difficulty making it work. Medication review works sometimes if it's really intensive. 
and multiple strategies are tend to be more successful, particularly in rest homes. Okay, take home messages. Remember risk factors, manage the injury, do check for postural hypotension. That's one thing we don't do enough. Please, please look at the medications and recommend cognitive challenge, refer them to the activity programs and home OT. And I found the referral under Care Connect e-referrals under Older People's Health, which takes you to the link for older people's, for the activity programs. But that's in the Auckland region. How many people here are from outside the Auckland region? Okay, so in New Zealand Doctor, I think on the 9th, there'll be an article about this, and it's got your local provider written there. So give them a call and work out how to get them. Home OT, of course, is a DHB referral. Okay, sorry to be... Thank you.